written to the last of the three major paragraphs explaining why Stalin was this winner in the leadership struggle. This is much more about Stalin's personal, or probably more accurately, Stalin's political skills, i.e. his ability and his sense of politics and his ability to sort of relate to people and his political now, when to move, when not to move, and how to move. And so therefore, this is very much almost one that is interrelated to a number of factors, um, which has an interaction with how he uses the office, how he has a sense of how to best appropriate it, how he uses the office to then in combination with his ability to to always seem in the background and always seem unthreatening uh, and also his ability to manipulate and use his opponents yes it was their weakness for allowing themselves to be manipulated but in part we can say it's his ability to manipulate them to seem unthreatening to encourage that understatement so this one tends to have a little bit more linkage and people like to use this one as their overall conclusion um, as although the other factors are important it's his ability to manipulate plus a few extras some people will and it says this out there for analytical point one looking how it interacts with a the theme around the offices and analytical point two around this eight witness of the opposition opponents you do not have to do it this way though you can break it down in other ways so for example his political instinct and more of his ability to project an image and we'll talk about what those and how they fit later all you need to know is if you're going to make a linkage make sure you don't repeat yourself by talking about the linkage in both witness opposition and political skill power so you might talk about witness opposition those arguments if you then spend length talking about his political skills and then repeat that later in a future paragraph you are wasting time you're not really gaining much and it often can come off as quite uninformed and repetitive so i'd say leave the personal skills and the political skill stuff to this paragraph and something linked to that at best giving a breadcrumb hint a half a sentence summary of but this also relates to his political skills which we explore later full stop and use that and the conclusion to reconcile the combinations and the links so Stalin's first political skill was to recognise that legitimacy derives from Lenin. Lenin is one of the few individuals who has name recognition, brand recognition, if you will, um, across Russia. Uh, and Lenin, being the undisputed leader of the Communist Party, um, Stalin realises and uses his offices to make sure that he can best put himself in the position of Lenin's natural successor. Now, although um, Lenin did not want to be the autocratic strongman and didn't want a cult of personality, what he wanted, particularly after he died, does not matter. So because of his approach and his sort of distance from the party, um, you can argue that um, for most Russians, they did not see someone who would naturally follow Lenin, his natural successor, someone who is the same leadership, someone who Lenin likes, and so on. Um, so what Stalin um, does is he uses a lot of his time, particularly in the early few years, to try and sell himself um, as Lenin's successor. Now, the important thing is it's going to take a few decades before Stalin feels confident enough in his own power to start suggesting he's Lenin's equal. For most of the next 10 years, and particularly during a power struggle, it's very much that of a disciple. <coughs> someone who's less inspired, um, someone who perhaps is less important, but someone who understands that and is respectful of Lenin's legacy and certainly more than the other leading Bolsheviks. So a loss of the image he's going to present is almost like a son. Okay, speaking as son of a great man, um, and that really hits a sort of a sense of politics and the sense of how the world works, which appeals to the average Russian. So, um, what he will do is he will cultivate an image of Lenin's natural successor through first his controlled access to Lenin. If you remember, that's one of his roles when Lenin had his strokes, and this picture on the right is very much from that, which he will make sure that he has plenty of access, particularly with photographers, of him with Lenin in his retreat. These will become commonplace after Lenin's death um, to sort of subconsciously, or at least um, uh, a certain terms of association, suggest Lenin, Stalin as Lenin's natural follower. Um, Bakarin, who controls the media and is an ally of Stalin throughout, will use this to perpetuate um, and will make sure that a lot of these pictures get in, particularly when Lenin or Stalin is there. Um, one of the few books Stalin wrote, The Foundations of Leninism in 1924, um, uh, will also try and reinforce this idea. Essentially what this book is, is as you imagine Stalin, it's not a high intellect book, but it's an, it's an ideological tract 
designed to explain what Leninism is to a less informed, less educated population, i.e. Stalin's natural people. And this book particularly was made mandatory to Lenin enrollment, something we talked about in the last previous lesson, where um, Stalin encourages a large chunk of people to be brought into the party who are less educated. And their, their book they have to read is Stalin's book about Lenin. And that, by association to people who would not know better and certainly don't know any of the leading campaigners, um, will have this idea that Lenin um, was obviously the big boss and was the foundation, but Stalin is the person, the Lenin whisperer, the person that close to him and so on because Stalin is the one writing the book and therefore it's not just that he wrote the book it's how he then uses his office as chief administrator to make sure that the new recruits have access to this book above all others um, to help engender this idea that because he is the person writing the book about foundation of Leninism he is Lenin's natural successor as, as mentioned as well, um, at Lenin's funeral, Stalin will make sure he takes the position of the son or the chief mourner, i.e. by the head, um, uh, at prominent positions all the way through, even though he's a minor figure. Um, and this is particularly game because the average Russian the, um, and the average even minor Bolshevik will not necessarily know the inside, or definitely won't know, the inside operations of the, of the Communist Party, haven't heard the last, last will and testament. And therefore Lenin is almost um, associated to Stalin indirectly in the minds of many of these people. Now this is important because this will give legitimacy to when he tries to become a leader. Um, Lenin's actual successor gives him sympathy in the early years and gives him a sense of like, well, he's Stalin, particularly when combined attacking to the center. His brand as someone who's a moderate who just wants the communist party to get on and it will increasingly be seen as the way that you justify in a communist system one leader because he is a natural successor. But it's important to realize that most leading Bolsheviks knew the truth, knew that Stalin was not not necessarily popular amongst um, Lenin. They had read the Will and Testament. Um, and therefore, this didn't really persuade them. But it's more influential for those who are regional party level, Congress level, and new members of the party who don't necessarily know the ins and outs of how the reality is. They see these guys from a distance, and they are the ones who are bought off by this image. And so by building the sense of that he is truest to Lenin's ideology, that he is a nominated um, successor, this gives him that legitimacy that he is a leader. That makes his building a power base easier because people will know him as the guy close to Lenin and therefore someone probably who's ideally safer, but also means that they are less likely to bulk, less likely to be suspicious when he tries to become a major leader. So essentially, Lenin's next, Stalin's deliberate positioning as Lenin's actual successor will help him build his power base, but in addition, will, particularly in a later later years will mean that people are more willing to accept that Stalin will be ma the major leader over time. Now this is particularly important when combined with his next major thing he does which is tacking to the centre. <coughs> Stalin's brand will be the guy who cares about communism, the guy who follows Lenin and therefore the guy who's always in the middle in any dispute. Now you can see how selling yourself as a follower of Lenin cannot be reinforced if you take extreme positions but if you take moderate positions that's reinforced and him taking moderate positions only then is then in turn reinforced by Lenin's natural successor so these two work together so by tacking to the censor is basically when Stalin throughout this fight throughout the struggle generally puts himself as the moderate generally puts himself as the middle ground generally puts himself as the Len following what Lenin believed and there's enough vagueness in what Lenin says and enough vagueness in the story that he can legitimately sell himself as that so what does he do now he naturally make sure his enemies are fighting one another in the early years Trotsky versus Kamenev and Zinoviev then Bakarin versus Zinoviev and so on so the first thing he does is by putting himself as the moderate he's always the guy who's always Always trying to avoid fight and that helps his reputation because it means that he's not getting attacked in the early years that means because he's not getting attacked he's not made enemies he's not seen as bad and while everyone else's reputation is being trashed he stays fine but in addition people notice the fact that he is just quietly trying to get everyone on he's quietly trying to make people friends he's trying to get stuff to work and that really helps this image that he is a moderate he cares about the party, not the his own personal power, and also that he is Lenin's natural successor. So again, that moderateness means that his political reputation and his brand is helped. In addition, uh, we mentioned this before, but by being the moderate, when Zinoviev and Kamenev brutally trash Trotsky, when Trotsky brutally trashes Zinoviev, the supporters 
of those individuals, many of whom are still in party congress or local party positions, are more likely to trust Stalin, the guy who wasn't, even if there was the enemy, didn't say anything rude, didn't do anything bad, and therefore join up and join Stalin's power base uh, and lend their support to Stalin as opposed to those rifles. So again, this strategy helps him build up his power base because he does not alienate key groups of support. Because yes, even if you get rid of leaders and perhaps some of their outspoken supporters, you can't really get everyone for factionism, particularly in the first first few years and Stalin doesn't really care about what you believe as long as you are loyal to him particularly in the short term at this point so therefore by focusing the attention of the enemies onto each other and getting them to fight amongst themselves he is a let his divide his strategy of divide and rule allows him to build up his power base and build up his brand and this is vital for that power struggle in ways that we've already discussed in addition the more the less well informed and the less well um uh that's knowledgeable are more likely to view the moderate Stalin as someone who is more focused on the party and the bigger picture than fight, petty fights and it helps his popularity amongst these groups who tend to be less ideological. Someone like Stalin who has deeply taken an unideological line is going to be find um, more sympathy amongst those Lenin enrollment guys, those new guys who come in over time. Um, and again because he's taking a centrist position, because he's taking a moderate position, which, quote, is in the interests of the party rather than myself, it really helps reinforce that image that of Stalin as Lenin's natural successor, the one who cares about the party, cares about the future, cares about collectivism. I know that doesn't sound right because he doesn't, but if you think about how people saw what was going on, it certainly helps that, and therefore helps his brand, helps his legitimacy. Um, and in, in addition, because he is taking a moderate position, his future ideology, socialism in one country, will seem moderate as a result. Because he is a moderate guy, any ideology that comes from him will be seen as moderate. And therefore, it makes the support for social in one country greater, because it is instantly associated with moderation. Something which the average Russian will perhaps be more interested in than other factors. Okay, As well as this, we have already seen that throughout, that Stalin's instinct of how far to push stuff and how far to challenge stuff is always um, uh, particularly good. Uh, and how we've seen about how, in some cases, against uh, Bakar in the early years, he falls back when he needs to. He knows how far to push when he needs to. And therefore, we've seen not only the weakness of the opponents, but his ability to take advantage of opportunities when they emerge, but not when others. So, for example, opposing Trotsky's expulsion in 1922, uh, sorry, 24. Um, uh, his with setting back on the rec grain requisition in 1928 doing just enough damage to the NEP to lose the trust of peasants and therefore make it implode but at the same time pulling back um, polit for political cir circumstances as well as this the, his ability to be in this to be discreet to tax the sense without anyone noticing but to reassuring his opponents that he's on their side even though he's doing less um, and making sure that they don't suspect his ulterior motives or his bigger um, picture naturally helps his position. He's hard to attack to the censor and hard to maintain alliances if people are suspicious of you. And therefore his ability to make sure people are not fully suspicious of him is a very, very helpful thing. And therefore, although he is um, particularly important, therefore, uh, and though, though he's particularly powerful, he's able to sort of not use that, he's able to make sure that does not lose him support and make people suspicious from, of him things like Trotsky on the other hand who was powerful but people were suspicious of him they turned on him very quickly and we can point to a lot of his actions in the power struggle from the Lenin enrollment to the party list and all this other subtle stuff which will build up his position um, which you know um, in turn uh, his decision not to do for cabinet for factionism in 1927 you know in that sort of stuff um, as a sort of evidence that he is skillful in this game and has correctly diagnosed that it's about power bases about alliances and so on and we can point to a lot of stuff we mentioned that less when we did the story for that purpose now we can his last thing we can talk about is socialism and country 
Social One Country confuses students because it's not one idea. At some points, it's NEP. At some points, it's industri- mega industrialization and NEP. What you need to understand is Socialism One Country is not good because of what it contains. In that actuality, it's Social One Country is good because it's vagueness. Because it's this vague, chest thumping, we are strong enough, we can do this, we can grow ourselves. It is broad enough to allow him to both position himself in the center and change what social one country is at any one point and this allows him therefore to move his position and gives him a vehicle to to change his position without anyone noticing i he can always position himself in the center but shift subtly where he is it depending on if he's fighting bakarin or he's fighting as an even camera and as allied with bakarin for example okay in addition, social one country is quite simplistic, is quite limited, um, but is sh- nationalistic, chauvinistic, and simplistic enough and chest thumping enough that it appeals to newer members who are increasingly infiltrating and joining the lower party ranks and working their way up. Um, as a result, the Lenin enrollment and so on. And we can say that because he's finally come up with his own de- idea in 1926 onwards. Um, this makes him look like a player. Without Social One Country, he's still a bureaucrat. With Social One Country, he's an actual politician who now has a legitimate argument for being a politician and having a say. And therefore, what we can say is, by being a leading member, by being a new member um, who has an ideology, he looks more like a leader who could be a leader in the future. Gives him that legitimacy, in particular in the later years, makes him look like a credible leader going forward. And we, although, yes, he has a great position in the party, one of the great risks he has is because he's so associated with bureaucracy it's hard to take him seriously this enables him to be taken seriously going forward and finally socialism one country is deliberately linked to lenin a lot of it is linked to lenin speaking and therefore is again used to reinforce this idea that he is um one of um lenin's disciples and his natural successor now we could also say that there is a balance here lenin uh sorry stalin's skill in manipulating these situations isn't always perfect think about how he got his phone call to lenin's wife that led to the postscript think about how he pushed for requisitioning which is spelled incorrectly um uh for requisitioning um and um his pushing against removal of Barbara Carr in support in 1928, which re- required him to make hasty retreats. Now we can say he was skillful in that he recognised the need for retreats and didn't die on his hill. But at the same time, we can point out actually in reality, this is a flaw in and of itself. We can also say how far do these skills matter if he didn't have the officers? Yes, he has the instinct. Yes, he's able to attack the centre. But if he didn't have the officer general secretary, if he didn't have the power base, this would mean little. And although people like to say, well, it's his ability to use the officers, we can also argue if he didn't have the officers, these skills would have no way to manifest, no way to happen, no way to have an effect. So we can say actually these skills in term are dependent on his office. We can also point out that is he politically skillful or is he just better than the average Communist Party um, contender at this point? And therefore actually is he skillful or is he just opposition's weak? If he was up against some, someone more skillful, if Bukharin was more switched on, if Zenobia and Kamov didn't split the party, if, if Trotsky was better, what would he still be able to win? Because his skills are only relative. There's no absolute skill. You are the best in the world. It is you are better than your contenders. So we can say, actually, is this him being skillful or his um, opposition being weak? weak? So if we're going to summarise, we can argue, therefore, that Stalin's clearly had the ability to manipulate his given circumstance to his advantage to manipulate weak contenders to use the bureaucratic offices that most people don't think is powerful to their maximum but in and of itself without the currency without the opponents who are so weak it wouldn't necessarily be as effective so we shouldn't necessarily just say oh automatically it must be his political skill because that's how he manipulates it this is a self-reinforcing thing and that in part is a difficulty of this essay all the factors linked to one another and it's your mission particularly in the conclusion but written into where you hopefully know where you're going into your analysis um uh, all the way through the paragraph that 
explains which one of these is the more important. I strongly recommend, therefore, in this essay, you have you have a baked in conclusion, which one is the most important. So long as you can justify it, it doesn't matter which one. But you need to have a strong sense of where you're going in this essay, because if you change your mind halfway through, often you've lost opportunities to sort of hint at or explore these links. This essay will probably be your longest paragraph, maybe the exception of success, um, in the entire stun, sorry, longest conclusion, outside of um, that essay um, in this entire style and section and so you need to be prepared for that you need to make sure you have a sophisticated way of saying why although everyone is dependent on everyone else this is the most important next essay is focusing on success and focusing on Stalin's economic policy first thing we need to do is look at his aims but until then um, I wish you the best of luck and once again this is about explaining the links and being able to manipulate the links to make a credible argument. Until next lesson, I'll see you in the next video.